Yeah. You can be nice during the day, but afterwards. Discussion, or then you can ask me a question, or ask me to come in and I mean you can improvise something like that. Yeah, I actually talked to. Uh, he, he could be. Ah, he would be the. He, he could be the moderator. That's fine for you. Mm. No, no, absolutely. Yeah. I have no problem with whatever you know, with these things. But I don't know the translation of how it is. But it's inter intermediate of some. Mm. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to remember to speak slowly. Mm. What, what, what is your slides? Oh, you don't have slides. Buenas tardes, buenas tardes. Es un plaer tenir aquí a l'Ateneu en aquestes dues persones que mos donaran una petita introducció perquè supos que podien rellar molta estona. Creo que podrien hablar mucho tiempo sobre la transición energética, en este caso con el ejemplo de la isla de Samso. Thanks for to you will be here and it's a pleasure to the Ateneo. I'm sure we will learn quite a lot of things. And the presentation is here. <laughs> Hola a tothom. Um, de part del Consell Insular, eh, estem molt agraïts i molt contents de comptar aquí avui i ahir amb la visita d'en de, Sorin i l'Alexis, que per nosaltres ja és... Els, els dic pel nom de pila perquè ja són com amics, com de la família. Han estat dos dies realment mm, superenriquidors i jo faré una presentació molt poc ortodoxa i, i molt breu, perquè crec que el que és realment interessant és sentir mm, com ha sigut la seva trajectòria, l'experiència que tenen. Per nosaltres, durant molts anys, sentir parlar de Samso era com la illa que havia fet allò que nosaltres somiem en fer. I era com... Eh, en el rànquing d'illes a les que sembla hermós a nivell de transició energètica, doncs la que estava... una de les que estava més amunt. I, i després d'aquests dos dies de parlar i de, i de sentir-los, de, de veure com han plantejat el seu procés, és cert que ens duen un avantatge de més de 20 anys en, en, en una trajectòria que realment ha donat molt bons resultats, però almenys personalment m'han duc la sensació de que, de que tenim moltes coses en comú en la manera d'entendre eh, com s'ha de fer la transició. Ells entenen, crec que entenen la transició com un procés social, econòmic i evidentment que també ambiental. Tenen una implicació contra la lluita del canvi climàtic que és enviajable. Espero que, que d'aquí uns anys, quan mirem cap enrere aquí a Menorca, també estiguem en la mateixa... Puguem mirar enrere i mirar com crec que ells ho poden fer. I, i, i m'enduc la sensació de que, de que ens han portat aire fresc en, en, en idees noves, en, en noves maneres de plantejar la transició i ens han donat com a ales per seguir endavant en el procés que estem començant. Perquè a Menorca realment... La meva sensació és que començam i tant de bo algun dia puguem arribar al punt on estan ells. Crec que en, 
tant Alexis com en Soren faran una introducció, la primera part serà per explicar com ho han fet, com és la situació a Samso ara, després de més de 20 anys de feina, quin és el paper que juga l'Acadèmia de l'Energia de Samso, que és molt curiós, també, és una experiència molt particular, que aquí no tenim alguna cosa semblant, però qui sap, potser neixerà algun dia una Acadèmia de l'Energia menor que és semblant a la Mirallada amb l'Acadèmia de Samso. I després també dedicarem un temps a que puguem preguntar, a que des del públic puguem preguntar perquè preguntant ens donen molta informació de com han plantejat ells les coses, que és una manera molt pragmàtica de veure la situació i buscar solucions. Per tant, jo ho deixo aquí. Abans de tot volia donar una altra vegada més les gràcies, perquè jo me'n vaig, que quasi no toca amb els peus a terra, de contenta i sobretot molt agraïda i espero que només sigui el principi d'una bonita relació, com se sol dir. Moltes gràcies. So thank you very much for, for seeing us uh, here in Menorca. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here and we have been kind of treated really good. We've had quite a lot of food. Uh, I don't know, I mean, food is apparently, I mean, we had both first and second breakfast. <laughs> it's like the hobbits of uh, the, the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> so, but, but anyway, it, it is very nice to be here and I'm very happy to share our history with you because I think we share a lot of, uh, of, of many of the same challenges and, and possibilities uh, as islanders and, and being in, in a surrounded by water, uh, isolated community, and with an ambition about being self-sufficient and, and sustainable within uh, the near future, and to be able to do something about climate and, and the relation with people and action and, and all the things here. Alexis is uh, also on the podium, and uh, he will be kind of my... my reflection door <laughs> to reality because I'm, I'm talking uh, in the beginning about historical, I mean, what we did 20 years ago um, before we'll get to the point where we start talking about what we're doing now. And what we're doing now is maybe more relevant for you in a discussion about how Menorca will take on this challenge um, for the future of your situation here and our common uh, global uh, situation, which I think is maybe equally important. So, I'll start with this. Energy Academy is an institution, it's an NGO, but it's not really an NGO. We, we, how we are the house of an NGO. Energy Academy is a house that, we call it the public meeting house or the public energy climate house, uh, where we meet and talk about energy change. We are hosting uh, an, uh, an NGO called Samsu Energy and Environment Office. We have like the electric vehicles organization, we have nature organizations, and many other organizations are living under the same roof. And therefore, we kind of share the address, and we share the, the space, and we share a lot of ideas here also. And so we try to be politically neutral. We also pr try to be outside the, what you call it, political level. We are not municipality. We are independent, so we can think and act as we want. <laughs> we are not under some political limitations here. I'm, I don't say that you are limited. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I, I try to say you have your uh, system and we have our system and we help, we assist the municipality on Samsu in realizing the climate action plans, which I think is a good combination and may maybe an advice for you was maybe you should also work a little bit to have these independent citizens organized uh, uh, meeting places, which I think you have, but maybe in the future. So to be an energy island, I mean, this is a picture of a modern, cultivated, structured society. I mean, fields of uh, canola oil or rapsol, but then we have these little entities where there's some biodiversity. And I think Menorca and Samsu is a biodiversity place where you have a multiple kind of number of elements that is society in general. So, so we try to be outside the structural industrialized life and, and still be part of it. So we have access to kind of the, the rest of the world, but we also try to kind of work within our own boundaries. I, I, I feel sometimes that the UN development goals and, and all the global talk here, I don't know if you're familiar with that, the, the, all these big political global talks here, they kind of become very s abstract and difficult to understand. Well, 
I do understand the perspective, but I don't really understand how do I boil that down so it makes relevance here where I live and, and work and act. So I think we need to turn it around sometimes and work from here and out there. So it's our standpoint or our point of views that is important. We, we are part of a system. So this is the electricity system of Denmark. So we can see, uh, I have a point that we have a connection to Sweden. We have a connection to Norway. We have a connection to Germany, two places. So we can distribute in and out of Denmark in a North Pool electric system where we can produce as much wind power as we can because we have a bigger market around us where we can export and import in and out of Denmark, which is an advantage. This is good for, for renewable energy that we have a bigger market where we can send it out, put it up in hydropower stations in Norway, or maybe reduce some nuclear power in Germany or something else here and share electrons. Something's right in the middle, but I'll come back to that also. But this is an export-import. So sometimes we actually, you can see the total e energy consumption. This is one date in a year. So the electricity consumption is 2.9 megawatt, or gigawatt, actually, sorry. Then the wind turbines are now producing 3.6. So some days in Denmark, we produce more energy in electricity from wind turbines than whole, the whole country is using. So we are at a very high level, uh, but I, I'll come back to that. Collaboration between sectors is a necessary condition for a successful, sustainable transition. What I mean b by this is that we have been exercising, like, a, 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 what do you call it, a challenge of bringing people together around the table to make these decisions. So it's not just an NGO saying that we should be more clean, uh, no to nuclear power, and out with oil, and in with wind, and stuff like that. We say we need to bring people around the table to be able to make decisions about the future that is good for this, uh, this, this development. So the collaboration between sectors is something we do. And because we are neutral, we don't have an opinion, we are not stakeholders or investors, but we can invite people to sit around this table and thereby we can make very big projects actually without being compromised by private interest or private money or stuff like that. And therefore, in 10 years, when we started this process, so the background for the process, I forgot about that actually, is we won a competition in 1998 to be the Danish 100% renewable energy island. We won it because my minister of the environment, he went to Kyoto, which was the COP3, the third COP meeting in the world in 1996, where he promised that he would go home to Denmark and announce a community that would make a demonstration that it was possible to change to 100% renewable energy in just 10 years. Very ambitious. I was the first staff to be hired there. You can see I'm getting old now. Uh, I was much younger and stronger then because it was a really big job to do that. And I kind of had to convince people from Samsø that we are now the Danish energy island and we have to prove that we can change from fossil fuels to green energy in 10 years. I don't know if you can imagine what people th were thinking. They thought he is crazy, he is out of his mind. This is not going to happen. This is something from Copenhagen. I don't know which term you use here. Uh, this is something from Madrid or do you, do you think so like that? Like? That's the same feeling. <laughs> it's from the capitals and they can't be really good <laughs> because we didn't say it. <coughs> but nevertheless, we, we, we pr have uh, 11 wind turbines on land producing all the electricity. We have 10 offshore wind turbines, three, four kilometers off the island. They produce the equivalent or the same amount of energy as we use for transportation, including ferries and tourism and everything. And then we have four district heating. I don't know if you're familiar with district heating. Instead of having individual heating system in every house, like a boiler using oil or gas, we have now district heating with a central boiler and then a pipe system where we pipe hot water around to all the houses in the neighborhood so they get heat from straw or wood chips or things we have on the island instead of imported fuel from outside. So therefore, in less than 10 years, we became 100% self-supplied and more. We actually exported energy off the island because we produced much more than we consumed. So you could say that we became carbon neutral within 10 years. So we actually made it, we did it in 10 years' time. That was very good. And so how did we do it? Because we invested 70, 80 million euros worth of energy installations shared by only 4,000 people who live on the island. So that's a lot of money per capita. But the saved energy, 
I mean, the conserved energy, we saved more than 20% of the present co energy consumption and we stopped importing oil. Oil prices went up and up and up in these 10 years, from $30 per barrel on the market in 1998 till almost $130 per, ma per barrel in 2008. So in 10 years, the price went up like crazy. So therefore, we saved a lot of money by changing to our own fuel. So we created a kind of circular economy where we kept the money within the island. So farmers started selling straw to the district heating. So they kind of hopefully invested their money in a new barn or some installation where local builders could then build it. So we created a local market for energy on Samsø by doing this. And much more, you can find it on the website. I don't, ha I don't want to go into details, technical details uh, with this. I don't know th if there's a lot of engineer or technical nerds here who love the details of technology, but that's another day. <laughs> <laughs> so Samsu is also a beautiful place. You can see how nice it is. Do you agree? It's really beautiful. Maybe it's the most beautiful place on earth. You disagree, and that's good. Uh, you like your place. This is also beautiful here. I've seen it. But this is something we also t want to protect. We don't want to put wind turbines and solar panels in this beautiful area. It's not, we're not here to disturb and uh, spoil the landscape. S but as anyway, we have to put wind turbines in. This is very early morning, so this is looking east. So the, uh, so the sun is rising, and we have these megawatt wind turbines in, in the horizon. And I think they, kind of, they are not really ugly in the landscape. What do you think? They, they work. It's fine. Yeah. You're not. You don't disagree totally. No. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> but they are there now, and they they are spinning around. They go very slowly, uh, and they don't. I mean, they, we can't hear them. But here you have a, a smokestack, and smoke is coming out. This is 20 kilometers away. It's like from here almost to Mallorca. Oh, that's a little bit more maybe. But this is a nearby mainland, Sealand, where Copenhagen is. And this is a power plant where when we started, they used coal to produce electricity. And not only here, also to the south and to the west, we had three different power plants that produced a lot of food pollution that came out. And we actually had acidic rain coming down to Samsø because of all the carbon dioxide that was emitted uh, from these chimneys. So we kind of used the argument that these turbines are a kind of ventilators that blow the smoke away from Samsø. <laughs> Maybe it's not all true, but um, the, the, the thinking is that when these are spinning, then this will re be reduced because we are producing green energy uh, and we don't have to produce so much from coal fire starting. Actually, now, 20 years later, this one has stopped. We don't use coal anymore in Denmark. We, are, we have changed to gas and other things, which has created another problem with Russia and Ukraine, but that's another story. That's another day. <coughs> but we also ended up having offshore wind turbines. I've heard, like the other day, that you are now, kind of, there's an area near your island that will be open for suggestions. Is that the right term? It's like a national, this is something from Madrid again. <laughs> they have pointed out areas where there's a possibility of erecting offshore wind turbines. And we also asked for that. There was no appointed areas in Denmark for this when we started the process. But we said in the plan, we need offshore wind turbines to cover the transportation because we need a lot of electricity to cover the ferries and all the other things here also. So we started the process already in the beginning in 1998. It took about five years, but two years later, in from 2003 to 2000, no, 2001 to 2003, they were up and running these turbines. And they were 2.3 megawatt turbines and the biggest in the world at just for a few months and then something bigger came really quickly hereafter. <coughs> we own them. So the local municipalities, they own five out of 10. Then we have two cooperative owned wind turbines and three company owned turbines, like private shareholders. So all the profit from these turbines came back to some sort of pockets. It was a very big investment, but, but, but because the Danish state had something called a feed-in tariff, like a guaranteed minimum price per kilowatt hour, then we could finance it via bank, bank loans, and it would be paid back by the production from the wind turbines. And 20 years later, we had generated so much uh, uh, capital from these ones, we could start buying panels and do other things. <coughs> this is solar, and you might think that Denmark doesn't have sunshine. I mean, sunshine is here. <laughs> 
what we actually do, so these solar panels, they produce 20% of the yearly consumption here also. So 20% of the, the, of the heat demand comes from solar panels. So we have 1,200 hours of sunshine, where I think here you have 1,500 or 1,600. You have a little bit more, maybe, no, I'm a, a lot more. But it's still valid to have the solar panels. So we invested in technology <coughs> uh, for the future. We have the most charging points and the most electric vehicles in any municipality in Denmark today. And why? Well, because we started very early. So we have first generation, second generation, now we actually have third generation electric cars. And all the public cars are electric of today. You have some in the municipality, I know. We have both trucks and, and, and what do you call it, goods, uh, vans and, 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 and private cars. And we have an extended system of chargers where people can charge their electric uh, vehicles also, so we are not missing out on that. That was a big fear when we changed from fossil fuel to electricity. Can I find a point where I can connect and charge my car? This is always a fear that you run out of power and you can't get any further, so it's very important for people to feel safe about that. We could invest in this outside the public budget because we earned the money from selling electricity from the wind turbine. So you have like an energy budget for new green investments, which could also be an advice for you to say maybe that's a, a way to finance new uh, installations. You're doing something with parking lots and other things. I don't know. I forgot to ask who is who has the right to park under the shade? Is it is it cost extra? Or? No. no? <laughs> is that a privilege for the special par kind of people or electric cars? It's just first come first uh, park. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> But it could be like a privilege where you like pay a yearly card and then you have the right to be there and connect to uh, electricity and stuff like that. So you kind of make people aware that this is good. So this is what you see here. We have the same electric uh, canopies and, and, and electric cars under them. All only electric cars uh, driving for all the services here. And the good thing about it is that before this, all the public servants of, of the municipality, they were driving their own cars when they were go out going out to service people uh, on the island, and they were then compensated per, kil per kilometer they were, they were driving with a certain state rate, and it was more expensive to pay them than it is to pay back for the electric cars. So the municipality is today saving money and driving more kilometers than they did before, but with a lower cost, and now much greener than they did before. So this is a really good idea. The other benefit from this was now we have a critical mass a critical number of electric cars. So the car manufacturer, or the car dealer, and the, and the mechanics, they can now fix them because they have all the instruments and electronics to, f to, to service and fix the cars, which they couldn't before because it's, that's quite expensive and specialized equipment they need to have there. And they have also educated the mechanics to be able to do it. So we kind of have a capacity building as long as we have the critical number of elements to do that. So we're talking about sustainability. I'm, uh, th this, I don't know how, is it the same word in, in your language, sustainability? Do you use the same word? It's kind of a fashion word, and sometimes we forget what it means. Sustainability is like, yeah, we are sustainable, and we are green, and we are all these sort of things, but do we really know what it means? So I try to break it up and say it is to sustain and to be able to. To be able to is like, you, you, are, you can do it. You have learned how to be sustainable. So it's, it's an ability, it's a, it's a quality, it's, a, it's something that you have to learn to be able to do it. Do you understand? So this is about communication, this is about education, this is about knowledge on how, how do you act and behave in a sustainable way. Sustainability is not just something you can say and um, this is a sustainable furniture or sustainable whatever, but, but how, do you, how do you handle it is very important. A strong, sustainable and robust community must share locality, activity and mentality. Locality is easy. This is here. This is Menorca. It's Samsø. Activity is the plan according to which we do things, like the master plan for 2030, which is indicating what are we going to do here to meet the goals or ambition about the, th the, the 2030 plan, which is nice to have. <coughs> but mentality, that's you people. That's you and you and you. Are you mentally on board? this process. Do you actually feel that this is good for Menorca, for my village, for, for me? 
because I think that is very important that you create kind of a feeling of a mental ownership of the transition. Otherwise, when, when we have to go to action and do things, people say, yes, but for me it's a little bit different because I have other plans. <laughs> and, and I think it's a very, very important uh, what you call exercise to work with the men mental uh, things here. This is Samsung seen from Google. We are much smaller than you are. There's 30 kilometers from here to here. <coughs> and there's kind of two islands, one the North Island and the South Island. And this is nature area. This is a Ramtar protected. We don't have a biosphere, but we have a nature park, which is a Ramtar, which is an international bird uh, resting, nesting area. So Ramsar is protecting every, you cannot build a house, you cannot do anything in this area. This is all protected and you're not allowed to go to on any of the islands because it's only for birds. <coughs> so we like this, we love this place because it's so beautiful. Um, so we would never do anything. But in the old days, you can imagine before cars, there was a long stretch here of jungle. So these guys, they didn't come down to the South Island. So they have a different dialect, the people from the North. I don't know if you have the same here that people from the other end of the island are a little bit Is the same? <laughs> Maybe they are from the north. <laughs> <coughs> and then in the south, we have the more cultivated and educated people, the smarter people. This is where you have the town hall and the mayor. And I need to say I live here also in this end of the island, <laughs> of course. But this is typical for local communities that you have like north, south, east, west, and people have their own individual way of being and, and thinking and stuff like that. And I think that is a high quality of life that you actually allow people to be there, have their own minds and be a little bit special uh, in their own kind because this is what makes humanity interesting, that you don't, you're, we're not alike, but we actually work with individualism, which I think is really good to be able to work in a collective. Otherwise, the collective will be useless if we, if we all were the same. So if you look at yourself, this is Denmark. <coughs> so we have Copenhagen over here, and then we have Fyn and Germany down here, and Sweden over here. Uh, so if you see Denmark, Samsø is right in the center of Denmark. We know that. I mean, we've known that all. I mean, the Vikings knew it because they were sailing from east to west, and Samsø was kind of the central place. There's a lot of Viking ships and historical monuments from the Viking period. So it's been a very active period before we got cars. Uh, so, so we feel that Copenhagen is far away. Samsø is the center. Do you have the? Do you feel the same? Madrid is somewhere over there in America. I don't know, uh, far away. So this is Europe. You can see the European Union have the headquarter down here somewhere. But you can see clearly Samsø is the center of Europe. <laughs> and this is this is the Earth. <laughs> you didn't know that. I can see that. <coughs> but the point, the point is, I try to stress that uh, as much as possible, this is, we are all in the center of the universe. Because we are right here, and this is from, from where we are responsible, and we have to take the next smart steps into the future. Here is a very important starting point for any action, because if you say it happens over there, or we need to go to Brussels to get a permission, or we need Madrid to talk to about this, then it becomes abstract and not relevant for us. We are limited by a law or regulation instead of being inspired by some good ideas that comes from here. And I think that is an important tool to activate the mental feeling of ownership for development. Power without love is coarse and ruthless. Love without power is sentimental. <coughs> I have a feeling that some of you have been kind of hippies in the 70s with long hair and kind of and you were listening to Bob Dylan and... <laughs> But maybe I'm wrong. But, but we still have activism where we really want to change the world and do something better and make the world a better place. But at the same time, very, very often activists don't have a lot of money and a lot of our authority and power. So we need to talk to the business guys and make them interested in what we do here. So this kind of coalition where we actually give way or make place for a discussion internally, where we have the visionary activists talking to the business guys and say to them, hey, you guys, have a look at green innovation. This is actually also a profitable business. Green business is, is also dollars or <laughs> euros. So maybe we can bring them on board so we can make them interested in the change that is necessary to make this happen. So the vision is interesting. 
The other day we had northern lights in Denmark. That's very, I mean, it's not every year we saw the northern lights in the future, and I kind of felt that this is magical. It happened so rarely. We stood up 12 o'clock in the night and went up on a hill, and we could see it up north towards Norway. They had this green light, like curtains uh, swinging here also. Seeing a rainbow is a little bit the same. It's magical. How, how, do, how does it happen? All of a sudden, you have this also. So this is the same with the, with the vision. When the vision becomes clear that this is where we want to go, all of a sudden it's kind of a magical that you have kind of a common vision about the future that is interesting. You can make it, make it everybody's individual vision, but I think it's very important that it's a dream. We can bring it down and take elements out of the dream and make it realistic and, 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 and get it to work. So when we create a common sense of ownership, the road is open for development. What do I mean by common sense of ownership? Well, it can be that you think that this is good, the local government has done a good job in making the canopies or the plans or the things here also. So we, are, we, are, we feel we are in the right direction. It is working for us. So this positive inspiration can maybe lead to somebody else's doing something here. So the farmers can do something, the fishermen, the tourist industry can do more. We live on a in a very green hotel who is kind of teaching us uh, how to behave and not to waste uh, handkerchiefs and blankets and stuff like that. So little by little, we're doing things that is making a lot of sense. These guys are in the beginning. This is my mayor. This is many years ago. That was a big challenge to have solar panels on the roof. I mean, groundbreaking 20 years ago, something we celebrated. It was in the news. <laughs> Today, it's normal. We just do it. People buy it and put them on the roof here also. So it's, we have these time lapse where things be from being kind of new and strange and expensive and maybe we should do it till now we almost do it automatically because it, we, we, we trust that it, the system is working. So time is with us and, and things are, f are actually uh, changing quite, quite, uh, quite fast. Uh, this is maybe a little bit complicated, but this is a map of, of the master plan. You could say that this is the north, so two villages could be connected with district heating. Three villages could be connected, one big town and four villages here, and another village here could be connected with district heating. But this was the plan. We had to go out and talk to people about this plan. Are you interested in being connected? And in the beginning, people said, hmm, no, maybe not because we didn't know what it was all about. It's, it sounds ex expensive and exclusive and something we never heard about before. So, but this was a map, very, very not detailed, but just m we can maybe do this because it's a very frat fragile thing not to come and say, so now we're going to make district heating and people kind of back off and say, not in my backyard. This is, this is going to be expensive. But say to them, there's a possibility we can make something that is interesting for you. You can save money. We can make a greener production. We can save oil import and, and start buying the energy from the neighbors. And by this, we kind of had openings here. So this is the chairman of the local citizens organization when we had like the first kind of, when we started the building, these things here also. And you can see everybody is having a, a beer in his hand. So maybe that's why we do things, to, to have a chance to have a beer and celebrate. Now we're doing things again. Cheers and <laughs> let's do something more. So we celebrate what we call a successful agreements about changes with people also. We have to remember to celebrate when we do something good because this is the mark in the, in the land saying to them, now we got this far, maybe we can go a little bit further. So, <coughs> and by this we did a lot of int interesting things, things we couldn't dream of doing when we started the process. This was, com was complicated and, stu and big stuff, but we did it and we learned how to do it and we educated plumbers and electricians and carpenters and builders so we, are, we have the capacity now to maintain and run these things. We, c we couldn't before, so it was a steep learning co curve also to do that. Radical societal development calls for top down and bottom up to walk hand in hand. Sometimes we think that changes come from, th from the center, from the capital. But very often I think the action comes from bottom up, this comes from you. And you can see, when you have seen it, you also want it to happen. And therefore you are a, a big, what do you call it, important reason for things to happen here. If you make up your mind and say to so them, we need to do this and show your interest. Then the politicians and the bureaucrats, they need to work in favor of you, for you, because this is why they are there. They have to remember that you pay their salary. Do, do, do you know that? <laughs> 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 uh, 
And therefore, there's a, there's a good relation here also because it has to make sense what we do here. <coughs> um, and these guys are local, local hippies and business people this buying, buying offshore wind turbines. I mean, this was my teacher when I was very young. So he's now retired. So he was interviewed by media and things. And why do you have solar panels on my roof, on your roof? And he explained to me, when I, fir when I was a math teacher, I had a Texas calculator with a solar charger on it. Remember these calculators? You put them in the window and they could recharge the battery. Super high-tech space technology. <laughs> when you had these things, that was very interesting. And he had one of these and he said, one day I'll have solar panels on my roof. And he used his pension fund to put solar panels in, on his roof. And he was out looking at the meter every day to see if I'm, he was producing or buying energy. If, if the sun was not up and it was cloudy, he would run around and pull our thing out of the wall and shut it down so he shouldn't buy energy from the, from the system. <coughs> so, 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 so participation is many things. If you want to, to, to develop and change, it's important to meet, meet people where they are. This is something I, I have learned the hard way many times. Sometimes I've been very energetic in public meetings. I said to them, you people, I have a new idea. We've been working with this. I think it's a really great idea. What do you think about it? And then it's totally quiet in the room because people haven't thought about it yet because I've just told about it. So they haven't had a chance to think about it. So sometimes people are busy with other things here also. Maybe it's the middle of the tourist season. That is a bad timing if I want to introduce something new because people are busy renting out rooms and cooking and, and servicing the tourist business because that is a big, uh, uh, what they call a season for, for action. So maybe timing is important. Then the purpose is also important. Maybe I forgot to call someone and say to them, we well, have this great idea, what do you think about it? Like make a little study here and survey and what do you think about it? Get somebody's opinion about it so I can adjust the process so it kind of fits into what we are thinking about and dreaming about in the daily routines. And then when we have the public meeting, I know I have maybe 10 people in the room that already was introduced to the process, have had time to go home and think about it and maybe have some ideas to add on to the existing structure. So ownership becomes shared, and not just from me to you, but a shared process. We don't do that very often, but sometimes we do it. And people from the village, they, they volunteered to do it. So we were the world, we are the world for a little while. Just holding hands is an interesting thing. Let's make a circle around this good idea here. So I use this image and pictures because I want to showcase that we are actually friends also. Not every day. <laughs> we argue a lot. I mean, this is people from the north, so they are really crazy. But <coughs> they live in a very historical old village. And th one of the things for district heat was that people had central heaters because they are old, very old wood frame house. Some of the houses are 300 years old. And they said, we cannot put radiators on the wall in the house like this. They are not meant to. They are used to have a fireplace in the middle. And then th the walls are cold because they are made of mud and clay and stuff like that. So we can't do that. What we did was we invented, together with some companies, like panel heaters. They were sitting at the floor, like panels. You have them down here, like this little board. We just made them a little bit wider. Then we put heating pipes inside, so we couldn't see them. They were totally hidden in the house, and it was very easy to install. So the houses would maintain being old and charming and smart, and they had a new heating system without any, any visible impact in it. So these people were happy, yes, let's do it. That's fine. But so that the, 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 kind of the idea became difficult when people thought we we're going to rebuild the whole, whole house. And it became easy when we saw it's just a panel around the wall here, and then we're going with the process. So sometimes technology can help us in the process of making people interested in and on board the process. <coughs> These are Vikings. You know the Vikings. I mean, we come from a Viking tradition in Denmark. You, I don't know what you come from, but you probably also come from a very proud tradition of, of, of local culture. And I think the importance of the Vikings was they were building on trust. Because, I mean, imagine they, the Vikings were the first in America. I think there's some ideas that Columbus, he was the first, but he came like way, I mean, much later. <laughs> but imagine these guys, there was they, they, these guys sat down around the, the fireplace and somebody said, I have an idea. I think we should sail west. I believe there's something out there. 
I see birds fly that way, and birds are not that stupid. They don't fly in, into the open with, with no idea. So let's, let's do something. Imagine they then organized a boat, a big long boat, and they got food and everything, and they said goodbye and kissed their wife and said, so I'll be back a little bit later. I don't know when, <laughs> but we're going west now. And they started rowing, <laughs> sailing. So these guys, they decided they, they have been talking about the dream about something big somewhere out there, like a change to better climate and other things also. And they were rowing. After one day, I think somebody probably said, can I say something? If we turn around now, we can be home for dinner. <laughs> and somebody else said, no, no, we'll give it one more day. Let's, let's, all right, okay. <laughs> one more day. And finally, they ended up in Newfoundland. And they actually, there's traces of Vikings in Newfoundland, in Hudson Bay, in Prince Edward Island, and down, all the way down to Maine. Why? Well, because they had a dream, and they kind of followed their dream, and they helped each other achieve the dream. I think it's the same thing. We need to gather around something nice, which could be food. <laughs> I saw that. And, and celebrate that we actually want to talk to each other. We want to share ideas and dreams. And maybe work a little bit harder to get there. Because it is a long haul and a, and a big job to change. And we need to row for more than one day before we get to the point of change. <coughs> An experiment doesn't have to be perfect. Experiments can open the way for something radically new. Today we are so used to technology being very efficient and it works immediately. I mean, if there's something wrong with it, we just give it back and we, we get a new device or get it fixed. I think we should accept that what we are aiming for here is not normal yet. It is something we need to test and try out before it will be market ready and work here also and accept that there will be some uh, mistakes every now and again. This is not a mistake that we can blame somebody to, do, to, to have done, but we need to share the risk of change because there is a risk. What if there was nothing out there and they had to row all the way back again? I think the captain w wasn't so popular after that, but maybe they had a great trip and had some good talk, so I don't know what they did here. We have to, we have to try. And it's a constant trial also uh, for the future. <coughs> These turbines is kind of the manifest of what we did here. They, they, they were controversial when we erected them. People hated them in the beginning. They thought that all the birds would die and there would be so much noise we couldn't hear. I mean, the, the, the birds singing and stuff like that. Today, we, I think they will be protected by kind of the heritage group here also because now they are iconic. We have had them for 20 years and they are spinning and they've been doing a really good job. Now they are part of our story about Samsung doing something really good. We rode all the way to America and we found it. I mean, we erected all the wind turbines and we became sustainable. So the future, now Alexis, uh, you can warm up. <laughs> are we good for time? Uh, so, so the future is, I mean, we're looking at waste. I don't know what you do to waste. We have quite a lot of waste on Samsu also, and the society is full of waste. I mean, everything is wrapped in plastic and stupid things here also. And I mean, you can buy a screwdriver and it's also wrapped in plastic and you have to throw it away. You have all these different things here that is creating waste and organic food waste is also a big deal here. And why don't we digest it, keep it here and not let it be waste, but let it be energy and digest it, put it in a biogas plant and produce methane. This is what we aim to do and then put it on a ferry and sail with methane produced out of biogas from waste instead of buying energy from outside. In now we are also looking at batteries for ferries, but big combustion engines like trucks and ferries are the most efficient is still in many aspects combustion engines. And if we could use green, green energy instead of black energy, then we have gone f quite far. So this ferry is up and running now. Uh, it's a really cool ferry. It's a hybrid ferry sailing on gas and electricity. And it sails every, every second hour to the mainland. It's 170 cars and 400 passengers. And it's a really nice ferry because it's so quiet, because engines are electric. And the generation system down the hall is running on gas. We had this funny incident. We talked to people about it and said to them, now we're going to have a gas ferry. <coughs> so we are asking local housewives and cooks to make uh, recipes with a lot of cabbage in it <laughs> so, and sell it on the ferry in the cafeteria. So when people have had a lot of cabbage, all of a sudden they have to go to the toilet because there's a lot of gas coming out. And you imagine, 
So we told people that they will now be called, this is the captain, we have a lot of headwind today, so we need more power. Can you please go to the toilet now? <laughs> so <clears throat> of course, this is not right, but, but it's just the image of waste being energy. It's interesting because we are wasting a lot of energy in, in, in the whole waste handling system here. So I don't know what you do. Do you burn it here or is it sent to Mallorca or what do you do? With, or in the ground, you deposit it. We need to do some waste mining soon, I think, because there's a lot of resources lying out there. Uh, this is the crown princess. This is, uh, the in the future, going to be the, the crown prince princess of Denmark. She named it, so Isabella is a royal house of Denmark. I, I know you have a little trouble with the royal house of, of Spain, but... <laughs> <laughs> We kind of get along with the royal house, and they, they, they have, we use them to give names to things and open stuff, <laughs> which is good. So <clears throat> basically what I've been talking about is bread and butter. Bread and butter is an English expression of daily bread that actually whatever we do, we do because we need, we need the resource, we need the job, we need the income, we need the economy, both the eco social economy and, the co and, uh, and what we call the physical economy to be able to survive as a community. This, this is meant to attract y young people. I don't know if you feel it, but on Samsø, we had a long period where young people moved away from the island. Like in the 70s, in the, in the industrial period, he also young people who want to go to university, they left the island. They spent seven years at the university and they became like academics and hi very highly educated. And so all of a sudden there was no job for them on the island because Education uh, makes people so smart they can't work uh, manually <laughs> anymore. So they didn't come back. So we had like a depopulation very fast and an aging population also on the island. And the problem with aging people like me and some of you is that we st have stopped producing children. I mean, we probably like to do it, but it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore, the number of kids in the school and the, and the social life of the young generation is not there anymore, which is a v very vulnerable to our society. We need to have that middle group from 18 to 28 years old. These are the crazy change makers in the world, and we need them badly so they can be an inspiration for the, for the, for the local culture and the development of this also. What ha happened with the green development here? We created a very big number of new jobs to maintain and build and structure this also. So now we have a positive migration to Samsø. So we are from 3,700, almost 4,000 people today. So it's going up again. So we changed the pattern, which is really good. So that could be another argument for making change uh, that you want to change that destiny. All right, if you need more information, oh, this is a little, the energyacademy.dk is where you can find all these uh, informations. There's a lot of videos and other things here if you want to, s to see more. So for the future, Alexis. <laughs> so one of the things that has changed is that we, in the beginning we worked with energy. So changing fossil fuel to green energy, kilowatt to kilowatt and, and change the fuel. Today we're working much more with climate climate effect and emission of, of climate gases like carbon dioxide and methane and other things here also. And for this, we, are, we have created a tool. Maybe you can read us a little bit about that. Maybe a little introduction. Does this work? Yes. All right. But uh, my name is Alexis. I work for the Samsung Jack Garden for the last six years. Originally, I'm from Greece. Y hablo un poco de español, pero no me siento cómodo. Entonces, voy a continuar en inglés. Um, but before uh, talking about uh, tools, I would like to talk about muscles, because my last birthday, Soren took me with his boat to the offshore wind turbines, and we scrapped muscles out of the pillar, which was the dinner. So <laughs> that was very new to me, <laughs> about uh, having an open mind about this also. <laughs> um, uh, and I would also like to mention a little bit of this history how we came here um, at, at, the, at, the, at the end uh, uh, we have Mari Angela sitting uh, who works for the uh, an EU initiative called uh, Covenant of Mayors uh, Covenant of Mayors is a, an EU platform that brings municipalities together to exchange and one of the uh, uh, initiatives is, uh, is called the peer learning program 
So we both applied uh, in Sri Lanka and us, and they, someone matched us. Maybe because Samso and Menorca are both islands, <laughs> different size, but maybe something thought that this could be interesting. Um, so this is why uh, we're here. This was the this is the background a little bit. Um, and we also are part of, I think we didn't mention it, um, we're also part of a new uh, European initiative, which is um, the EU found some budget to put a team together. Most of them are based in Brussels to support islands in the clean energy transition, uh, to make studies, to arrange exchanges like this one, to um, organize local workshops and trainings and it's called Secretariat for Clean Energy for EU Islands. Um, and we are part of this structure. Um, and this is something we've been doing uh, the Samsung Energy Academy for many years, like decades. We've been traveling around and bringing people to Samsung for workshops and for trainings and bringing groups together and doing all sorts of things because we really believe in the learning of it for, from each other uh, process. And since you invited me, I would like to, I could also talk a little bit about the, the new uh, change that happened. It happens probably in many countries, probably in Spain there's something equivalent, but in, in Denmark three years ago uh, or four years ago, um, <coughs> there was a decision to change from calculating energy only and transport and emissions from these activities to include every single economic activity that produces uh, green, greenhouse gases, not just CO2, but others. This includes agriculture and the different soil processes and forest and land use and everything. And this is much more complicated than energy. So we stopped talking about energy calculations and energy audits and energy accounts, and we started talking about climate calculations, audits and accounts. And these are complicated tools that uh, needs uh, a very specific knowledge to use, but there are knowledge, no, very knowledgeable people uh, on Samso, in Menorca, in every place, to ask them the questions and to find the right numbers, so to know exactly how, contrib how much co from the contribution of Menorca to climate, how much is based to, is uh, because of, or attributed to buildings or transport or land use or forest and then if we plant uh, 100 trees what does it happen and if we change an area from uh, agriculture to forest what does it happen if we dry a wet area or the other way around what does it happen so this is a trend this is the bottom line is that this is a trend that would prevail at the end because there is at the EU there is the overall goal to be climate neutral continent 2050, this may seem too far away, but it's not that far away because <laughs> time passes really quickly. <laughs> but so this is a trend, that's what I want to mention, that this is something that we will all need to introduce in our thinking and in our planning. Um, and yeah, um, I think it would be a good time to have a discussion if you want to. Absolutely, yeah. So now it's up to you to get more information out of us when we are here. Um, we're going home tonight, so um, then it's too late. <laughs> <coughs> so do you have any questions? Um, do we need a microphone? <coughs> so there's a question yes. here. This gentleman here in the front, say second row. Yeah. Thank you for. Thank you very much. Uh, can you tell me how it was the stu economical structure when you uh, start this uh, to develop this plan? The chronicle. No, no, no. The structure, economical structure of the island. Structure. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. no, yeah. <coughs> you could say. Oh, I need to take this out. It's too many <coughs> devices. Um, Actually, we had a crisis on the island in 1997, 78. In my childhood, my father was a farmer on Samsø, 
And they, the farming community, could see that we had a centralization of all farming structures, like the dairies to produce cheese and, and, and milk, the slaughterhouses to pr process uh, meat and, and all these sort of things. They all was closed locally and moved to central places in the mainland. And they actually they left a lot of people without work uh, locally because there was, it was very difficult to replace these jobs with other jobs. So in the middle of us being the Danish energy island, we had a, we had a uh, labor crisis and therefore also an income crisis because all these people, we had 100 people working in the local slaughterhouse uh, to, to process uh, meat uh, in the house here. So they all had a wife and kids in the school and, and they were part of the local economy. And in 1999, it finally closed and sent 100 people off the street. That was exactly the same time we started the energy island transition. So you could say, we use this argument to say, can we recreate these jobs in, in a future transition? Because we need a lot of hands to make energy efficiency, more insulation in houses to make them save 20%. We need a lot of hands to build infrastructure to district heating and other things here also, and to build wind turbines and, and everything that followed in, in that respect. So, the, so we didn't have a good finance. The financial bu budgets were, were poor. We needed a lot of state support from, the, from Copenhagen to be able to survive. But they, they, they actually initiated programs. I haven't thought about it, but maybe that was why we got the program, <laughs> because they wanted to help us to create something new, so a new paradigm. And from then on, the economy became better and better again after that. But we have a long crisis that started in the 70s and in, ended in the 90s. Uh, because of a restructure uh, of, of the central Denmark. Can I add something? And, and actually, how, it, how is uh, divided the, the work in terms of uh, employment? How many people involved in this uh, project? How many people remain in the agriculture and other activities? Uh, the number of people of the in total. Yeah, I, I can't. I, d I don't remember the, the numbers out of my head, but you could say that the, the the agriculture is employing less and less people because they become more and more mechanical. They have more tractors and more machinery, so one man can look after much more land than they could before. They needed much more manual work. We have more people installing heat pumps and and doing things here today. So I probably we have recovered at least 50 new jobs instead of the, the 100 was there, that was there. But uh, on top of that, we have a s in the service industry, we have probably today 3,000 visitors every year to the Energy Academy from all over the world. They come, they, need, they stay in a hotel, and they need a, f a meal, and they need training and workshops and stuff like that. So the Academy alone employs eight people uh, because of this. Uh, they, they are jobs that was not there before. So it has created real change. Uh, in, in, in the system. And then we have other things. Culture has grown on some shows. We have more musicians and writers and painters and stuff like that. So, so, so we have an immigration to some shows, which means we need to fix more houses and build stuff and stuff like that. So the, the, the snowball has changed and is now growing before it was shrinking. I, I, I cannot recall the numbers out. Yeah. Can I add something? Yeah. Someone asked me earlier today <coughs> about what, what did it really mean to be nominated the uh, Renewable Energy Islands. And maybe some of you may have the same uh, question. That's why I'm, uh, I wanted to say it again. That was a title. It didn't come with anything. It was not an award that corresponded to, I don't know, money or um, uh, investment or capital or anything. It didn't even come for with a building or an office and money to pay the electricity bill. There was some seed money to cover uh, a part-time mm. person mm. Uh, because one of the requirements was to organize uh, public participation, to organize everything around public participation. So this came with a small budget to hire a part-time person for one year or two. All the rest had to be raised, fundraising. So all the investments that you saw, so 11 wind turbines on the island, one megawatt each, 10 uh, wind turbines in the sea, 2.3 megawatt each, and four district heating plants, the electric cars, the chargers, the canopies, everything was funded locally including the municipality. 
because Samsa has the advantage that it's one island, one municipality. So for example, so I mentioned that from the 10 offshore wind turbines, the municipality initially invested and owned half. But for many years, the local community owned 100% of all the projects, which is why it had so much impact. It is why so many, so many thousands of people come every year. And I learned also that Samsung is one of the uh, most touristic places in Denmark. So in the summer, it's practically impossible for big groups to found accommodation. So all these extra people and tourists, we call them energy tourists. They, expand, they helped expand the touristic season. So after, I don't know, mid-May, it's very hard. So they come before that, and they also come after mid-September. So it really helped expand uh, the tourist season and uh, produce more benefits for the local community econ and economy. Yes? Do you have more questions? Um, that was actually my question. How important is tourism on the island? Because uh, I think at least in Menorca, one of the distortive elements is that you have a lot of tourism during two or three months in the year. Yeah. So, you know, one thing is to be sustainable in May, and the other thing is to be sustainable in August. Yes. So how did you manage that? That was, I think, Alexi started answering. Yeah, I mean, if, if tourism is sustainable, or how, how much does it mean for the economy? How much does it mean for the economy, first? It, it, it f a couple of years ago, it took over from farming. Farming has been the major economy for many, many, many years, but now tourism is bigger. And we, we still produce a lot of potatoes. We, we have one big farm producing 7,000 tons of onions per year. Uh, that's 7, 7, 7 million kilo of onions <laughs> that goes out. That's a lot of onions. So every time in the, er, everywhere in the supermarkets in Denmark, you can buy a bag of Samsung onions or potatoes and stuff like that. So it's in, in amounts, in numbers, it's a lot of export. But, but the income is, is smaller now than tourism. So tourism plays a big, significant role in economy, which I think is not so good. But and a second question, how did you manage to spread out the tourist season? Because do you have like <coughs> fantastic beaches that people want to come only during a specific season? We have we, we, yes, we have a main season, which is six, eight weeks, where it's summer holidays, school holidays, and normal, normal holidays where people go. But then we have like people who p we, people are more flexible today with holidays. So spring is also very nice. If you're not there for swimming, but you're there for golfing, or we have a really, really good golf course. It's also totally sustainable, totally green, no fertilizer, no chemicals, nothing. It's all uh, organic. Uh, and it's still a super. We have Pro-Am, like the European Pro-Am tour is uh, having a stop on Samsung. So it's a high, high-end golf course that attracts a lot of people to come outside the main season where there's room and space that they can play golf. We have nature like bird watching people who come to study the migrating birds will will pass Samsu. We have plant collectors. We have a lot of edible plants and we have chefs that make training and courses in eating nature <laughs> and bringing people out to do things also. So I think the, the innovation has created a, a, a whole range of activities outside the main season where people just want to lie on the beach and do nothing. Uh, it's more much more active uh, tourism in the shoulder season or outside the main season. And then we have uh, energy tourism where we have groups after group that will come to the academy to participate in workshops and study and see what we do here. And of course, they are not there to see some old wind turbines only. They are also there to talk about an energy plan for Japan or for uh, America or from Spain or wherever we come from, uh, from, from Catalonia or from the Balearic Islands, the wherever. I mean, there's many that, that, that comes here also with their own ideas about what to do here. So Samsu is a good place to discuss that. You're away from home. You can be inspired by what we have done here, and you can bring, bring home some new ideas. Yeah. Yes? There's one here in the front. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about the limited... Uh, kilometer square yeah. of an island <laughs> yes. and um, do you think it would be the next bigger challenge to um, to not have an expand like in the continent yeah. a city can just expand and it can just because you talked about the people that were uh, coming to mm. the island now and after some time it will be crowded mm. the island and is there uh, something 
thought about this or do you think about how you can react with uh, too many people? I think some people on Samsung, they, they want to limit the numbers, say to them, we can only have so many because otherwise it'll be, it, it becomes like mass tourism. That is not good for anything. It'll, it'll, be, it, it'll be too tough on the nature and, 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 and on Samsung in general. And you need to put on a traffic light. <laughs> yeah, we don't have traffic light or roundabouts. I mean, people just um, behave <laughs> generally. We have very little traffic accidents, actually. Um, <laughs> no, that's not important. But the scaling of the process, I think Samsung has been an inspiration for many places that is not islands. So, so, so they start having municipal plans in central Denmark also that is actually speaking the same language. What can we do within this municipality to meet the climate goals here also? So, so they, and they use communication and activism as well. So they become attractive for different reasons in, in different areas of Denmark where they have some special solutions for this also. We are now looking into power to X, which is like some areas where they have a lot of wind. Maybe they should produce hydrogen and have like a fuel station for ships and, and, and bigger, uh, bigger transport units and to do this also. So they'll probably steal some of our tourists uh, in, the, in the energy business because this is some of the new technology that's very interesting and very promising also. So they will we'll have a stream going that way to, to study and, and be in that municipality. Some municipalities are, are producing something, maybe it's a little bit outside your question, but uh, producing something called green labs or like green innovation labs where they invite industry to come and, and make an uh, industrial uh, lab where they have like a, a biogas plant, a co-generation, a pyrolysis uh, project where they make charcoal out of uh, the bi biological material. And they put out of the fibers, they may be making building material and stuff like that. So within the same neighborhood, these companies, they use each other's waste products for, uh, for further pu uh, purposes. It's kind of industrial symbiosis. And I think that's really interesting. Samsung is not big enough to, to do that. So we need a little big, bigger community with a better infrastructure and more industry to do that. So I think innovation becomes an attraction and also a business. So tourism has a whole new dimension. And I think ecotourism or climate tourism will be kind of the new, new uh, selling point for, for some people. I really hope that because we need to learn a lot in a short time. Yeah. Yes? Um, I know you have worked very well and you are really on, on the way to, to be sustainable and to, to um, stop uh, the, the effects of climate change on your island. But other people, other, other states, other countries mm, are not working so much and the, the menace of sea level rising can affect you, not mm. because of your behavior but of the others. Have you, in your plan, is have you ever, it was uh, something th thought about this? Uh, all these uh, shore, offshore is, um, windmills and all that will be affected? Mm. Yes, I have thought about it. But I don't know what to do about it, <laughs> to be honest. But the, th but the thinking is that if we try to be the best example we can be with, with, the, with the means or, uh, or the injury we have here, we hopefully can be an inspiration for other, p other places. I mean, now we're here. I hope we can be an inspiration for you as well as you can be an inspiration for us so we can go home and do some of the things that you do, do well here. Yeah, I mean, you are a much bigger tourist destination than we are, so maybe you have, you have some ideas about how we can handle that. The, the other thing is that we, ha we have a name now. We're quite famous just not to be shy, to show off a little bit. But we are quite famous, we have a lot of awards. Two years ago we got the UN Leadership Award for at the COP meeting in Glasgow. So SAMSU, together with Paris and Guadalajara and Mexico, two like million citizens, uh, cities and SAMSU, <laughs> those three became the leaders of, uh, of the UN for climate action. So that's pretty good. Nobody knows about it, I don't know, you probably didn't hear it. But you <laughs> But somebody did, and, and we have now gained uh, an export contract with Japan. Mm -hmm. So Japan, after Fukushima, 
has had a big transition also because where they've been studying kind of centralized energy production in Japan and, and they've come to the realization that they need to decentralize, which w took many years. So now they have appointed uh, 50 out of, in the plan, 100 sustainable communities that will be realized before 2030, I think, mm -hmm. or something like that. And we have been announced to be kind of exporting our ideas to Japan to do that in a three-year program. And we, we have been doing, I, I just came back from Canada th two weeks ago, I, I was, I was uh, doing a, a presentation and a workshop with the, pr with the province of Prince Edward Island in the Hudson Bay in Canada. And they are running the same program, and after that I was speaking for the Federation of Canadian Municipalities in Ottawa, where, I don't know, 600 people were there to hear what was happening on Samsø. So you could say that we, if we still share experiences here also, maybe the inspiration can lead to a little bit less <laughs> sea level <laughs> rise and, and climate change. But I don't know, maybe. Good idea. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> but I think, I think it's important that we share ideas, that we are open and we go into network operations here also and talk about it. We have the EU Clean Island Secretariat, which is one, but we need to be open. You have the Biosphere Network also, the global, I think it's really cool uh, and necessary also for uh, things that needs to change here. So, so we have a global discussion and a local action plan. You have extra questions. I, I have extra, <laughs> extra <laughs> questions. Always about tourism, because I think tourism is like a big game changer. Yeah. Uh, I think you mentioned that you had a lot of tourism on specific weeks yes. and that you put limitations to that. Well, we have a limitation because we have a ferry. We, okay. don't, have, we don't have an airport. <laughs> and the ferry only sails so many times with a limited number of, of passengers. So okay. when we reach that, that's one barrier. The, the other limitation is rooms. I mean, beds. Okay. We only have so many beds. And if everything is occupied, people have to stay home. But if somebody wanted to come with a new ferry company, you would say no? Yes. Okay. <laughs> because the ferries are actually very dirty. Most ferries are using diesel engines and the, the emissions. Before we started changing, the ferries were guilty of 40% of the carbon emission from Samsung in total. So, and, and we have big, big capacity of ferries also because of tourism. Also because of onions and potatoes. <laughs> but, but, but we need to bring people over fast. So we are operating now with a new ferry. In, in 1st of January 2025, we're going to have a new ferry that takes 185 cars and six, 600 passengers. So that's extending the capacity. Okay. But that ferry will be fully electric. No, and you said at one point that there is a certain number beyond mm. which yes. uh, things would be too much of a strain on nature. That's right. So you do believe that you have to limit that in a way. Because we, saw it, we saw it during COVID. Okay. During COVID, everybody from Denmark stayed home. We saw it here, too. Yeah. yeah. People from your area stayed home as well and well, came Well, nature here. flourished. All right. Nature, so, nature so you flourished. So didn't, you didn't have as many tourists. Oh, no. We had, like, to the, to the limit of, I mean, more than the limit, because people couldn't travel. They yeah. couldn't go to Menorca and have yeah. a holiday here. They had to stay in Denmark. So they took the ferry and, and took a holiday on Samsø. <laughs> what house there? So uh, there was people everywhere. <laughs> it was crazy. Okay. Maybe like here in the summertime, but we're not used to that. No, but here it's like that in the summertime. Yeah, I know. Gracias. Um, primer només volia dir que si algú té alguna pregunta en català o castellà també la pot fer i la la traduirem. Um, we're going to translate any questions regarding the, the language people use. I wanted to ask if you have any advice on how to create spaces where citizenship can, can meet, can gather to discuss about energy transition topics. Maybe there's uh, certain um, ways of steering those meetings that you might know that can be helpful for us. Mm -hmm. Well, what we have done many times is also, I mean, we, do, we try to do that also. We have, we have created some tools and instruments to make people meet about critical and, di and difficult questions. So the municipality has a master plan for climate change for 2030 with some actions in it. And people look at it and say, to them, how on earth are you going to do this? This is very ambitious and you're going to change this and this and this. How is this going to happen? And pe people generally feel disconnected to like it top-down municipal plan. 
So what we can do as an independent entity, we can call and call some people and say to them, have you read the climate plan from the municipality? And people say, usually say, mm, no, not really. We, we've seen the front page, we know it's there, but we haven't seen it in details. All right, should we make like a study group that kind of go through the, some of the details, see, see what's in it for farming, what's in it for tourism, what's in it for uh, house owners and all the things here also, and then formulate local citizens work group and, and see how we can, can we raise some questions here and say how we're going to do that and, and maybe invite some specialists from outside, some, some, some people who know that and then comment on it and send it to the municipality so they can adjust the plan according to what we believe is realistic. And that exchange is really good. It's very productive and because we now gain kind of more ownership of the plan because we get to learn how what's in it. Because usually people don't read stuff like that. I don't, do you read public uh, publications from the municipality? <laughs> well, you do, maybe. <laughs> but usually people, people hesitate a little bit to do that. So we can help them do it, because it is important. It's decided by the politicians and stuff like that, so it's, it's our work plan. But we need to make it our work plan and make the citizens involved in the process. Sometimes we can also point at business potential sections. This will indicate changes in this and this area, and it could mean some business for some groups of people here, which makes them more interested. If there money to make, then people will open their eyes and ears. So the role of kind of being mediating or coaching this process is not to be teaching people, but to involve people in the process and invite them to participate. And people are actually very often ready to spend time on, on, on things that is, that is important. We just have to let them. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I'm gonna ask another question. And um, well, you've been two days now in the island. You've met different stakeholders. You've been visiting as well um, some of the sites where we're doing projects. Mm -hmm. um, you know that we have a plan and the structures that, that we use to keep it forward. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any general recommendations on how can we accelerate um, <laughs> the the process? <laughs> yeah, that would be easy for me to <laughs> say. Yeah, now <laughs> I'll tell you how to do things here. So I think that having a plan and being active in the process and having things in the go here also is important for the discussion uh, about the future because that now there's something to talk about. It's not just abstract things in the air that we want to be climate friendly or um, listen to this, blah, blah. I mean, it's important to boil things down to action based ac things that will happen where people can be involved, maybe more or less, but be involved. So keep that track in, in, in mind that you don't run away with plans, but you actually take the plan and rip it apart sometime and take this little bit of the plan and say, sort of, we need to discuss this element and bring it back into kind of play again, because then it'll change a little bit and time will also change plans. I mean, the plan we made five years ago is different today, of course. And it's different because people have an opinion and things are changing also, tourism is changing and and business in general is changing. So, so, and invite students and universities to do research and science here. Give them up, give them jobs, so they can work with it and bring back information. The next generation have other ideas, and they they do research and science in a different way. So you can use their brains uh, while they're studying before they become too expensive <laughs> to invite a specialist. <laughs> I think that is a good idea because then you have uh, academia involved in the process because there's a lot of, we need a lot of capacity to do this. This is not an easy job. What I've seen here is good. I like, I like what I see. I think you, are, you, are, you have great opportunity to do it. Uh, there's also a lot of challenges here. I mean, you have the big solar project in the, where is it? Yeah. And there's some smaller ones also. I mean, every time you be make technical installations, then you have like some conflict area that where there's a possible discussion going on. And that's necessary also. This is, you can't avoid it, but be open and invite people to have that discussion because this is part of the process is also to accept changes somehow, but not accept them blindly, but say to them, we accept them, but if we do this and this, we can do that and that then you can have influence on the, on the final process, I think. Maybe I'm optimistic, but I think people will listen to, uh, to, to, to sensible comments on, on changes. Now you have a new challenge with the offshore windmill. I don't know what you think about that. 
But that's something people have to consider again. And you'll probably have a lot of questions about birds and wildlife and nature and all these sort of things. But then you can call us because we have studies and surveys like so much because we've been looking at this also because this, this is important to know what's happening. We, don't, we can't just ignore it. But pollution, see carbon dioxide and acid rain has also been very bad for the environment. So what if this is less bad and, and is pointing in, the, in a positive direction? Then we need to evaluate if it's okay. And that's for you to participate. I think that is very, very important. But I feel that as an open, that's an open uh, door for these discussions. And also for investors and people who want to come here. I think that is that's very important. Maybe you can learn from tourism because tourism is, is a very aggressive economy. <laughs> and if you can control that, I think you can, you, you can handle the rest of it also. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, do you have some, the current turbines in some sort? No. No? We, d we don't have so much current or waves. We are like internal, the seas of around Samsung is more quiet. We have some current, but these machines are also a little bit problematic because it's very hard to be in the salt water and, and they, they're still testing them. They do exist and, and they use them some, some places and I think it's promising and also for the future. But we, we, we have evaluated it's better to put up wind turbines and other things, so it's cheaper per kilowatt hour. The other thing is complicated and, and needs a lot of service and salt water is really bad for the environment. Then I think we're going to finish. Oh, you had a question? No, uh, we're going to finish. And we would like to thank you not only for the talk, but for the two days that you have been here. And we've, I think we've all learned a lot from you. And we hope that we can keep learning from each other in the near future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.